Okay, that was enough about error rates and mutations. I don't see myself making you calculate those things on your own. Um, I just, I got carried away because I wanted you to see where the numbers came from. Um, and that is what it is. So now we switch to a new topic and we're looking at gene transfer. And this is a big deal in microorganisms. Again, with huge numbers of microorganisms, really random things happen at a frequency we can care about. So um, that's what we're going to see. First, we'll get some definitions. Um, there are two big types of gene, uh, gene transfer we see. One's vertical gene transfer. That's like a mother and offspring. So sending genes down to your descendants is vertical transfer. Um, and that's this. We don't care about that. Horizontal gene transfer um, is if this cell, well, if another cell over here that was unrelated gave some genes to this cell, that would be horizontal gene transfer. Um, we don't think about it very often in human physiology, but uh, it's it makes a big difference in clinical microbiology. This is... This is one of the things that uh, terrifies infectious disease specialists. Um, so when we look at vertical gene transfer, that's this. That's the diversification of all life on Earth. Um, just kind of random, random changes diversifies animals versus fungi and plants. Um, but if we look at among the bacteria and the archaea, there are cases where there's very fast changes because of horizontal gene transfer. So DNA moves from one cell to another in less than a day. Well, on the time scale of a billion years, that's the blink of an eye, obviously. Um, and the recipient cell, if it benefits from those genes, suddenly everything has changed and that one is going to win natural selection in its environment. Um, so what we're going to look at here are the three major ways that uh, bacteria can pick up new genes or share genes. These are the three mechanisms of horizontal gene transfer that we care about. Um, yeah, these are the big ones. So transformation is a big one. It's got a silly name. And what it refers to is cells taking up DNA from the environment. So I'm a bacterial cell swimming around. I see DNA outside. I grab it and make it my own DNA. It's a bizarre process, but certain types of cells do it. So um, that's transformation. Conjugation is a more specific thing where... Uh, one type of bacterial cell um, can make a pillus and basically inject its DNA into another bacterial cell. So um, what this, this is a more deliberate process than transformation um, and two cells are involved. Probably the weirdest is transduction and this is where bacteriophage, so viruses that infect bacteria, Instead of packaging bacteriophage DNA in their capsid, they accidentally package some bacterial DNA in their capsid. And when they go and cause a new infection, when they find a new host cell and they inject their DNA, they're injecting whatever was in the capsid and they inject bacterial DNA into the new cell. And so that's, that's a way a new cell can... Um, or new DNA can move from cell to cell. In, in science, when we are studying bacteria, we actually use all three of these to do genetic engineering. Um, different times in grad school, I have used all of these to get genes into uh, cells for purposes of um, changing their genomes. Um, for various reasons. So look in a little more detail. Transformation is when um, DNA in the environment ends up inside a new cell. Um, 
some bacteria can do this and we call them naturally competent. Um, one thing they have to do is recombination. So they have to replace something in their genome with this, with this DNA. And um, some cells are also better at that than others. Um, but yeah, once they do that, once they put new DNA into their genome through recombination, that's part of their genome and they pass it down vertically from then on to their daughters. Um, yeah, so transformation is one of the most um, common ways we get DNA into cells. It is the most common way. Every laboratory that does microbiology has the ability to use transformation to get genes into E. coli or other lab strains. So this is the, the famous experiment where transformation was discovered or demonstrated. Um, and it involved Streptococcus pneumoniae bacteria um, trying to kill mice. And there are two different strains we need to think about here, two different strains of this bacterium. And what we're going to see is a syringe and a mouse and a picture of what type of uh, bacteria are in the syringe. And then we're going to see down here, if you were to take the bacteria out of the mouse, you'd get colonies on a petri dish. And this is like what type of cell is in those colonies. So this doesn't represent any like physical thing you do in a laboratory. It's just showing, okay, well that colony secretly is that kind of cells. Okay, so there are two different types of cells. There's a pathogenic S strain, which, um, and a non-pathogenic R strain. So smooth versus rough. The idea is that colonies on a petri dish would look smooth versus rough because these make a polysaccharide capsule. So they, they have a glycocalyx that protects them from phagocytosis. These don't. That's the main difference between them. Um, and so what do you see? This mouse survived. If you inject these bacteria, the mouse's immune system can fight these off. This mouse, well, mice cannot fight off an, a big enough injection of the smooth strain. So, okay, so in this experiment, famously, um, the researcher Griffith um, heat killed some of the, um, some of the smooth strain and found that if they're if they really are dead, they can't kill a mouse and you can't grow them on the petri dish. Um, and what he did next was he mixed the rough strain, which was harmless, with dead versions of the smooth strain. So the heat killed smooth strain and the rough strain. And that mixture killed the mouse when neither one on their own could have done that. This one can't kill the mouse, this one can't kill the mouse. If you mix them, they can. And what he got when he plated bacteria was some smooth bacteria, some smooth strain bacteria had appeared. And he verified that that wasn't contamination. He didn't inject any live smooth bacteria, but there were some. So what happened? Well, these dead cells had DNA encoding the ability to make that glycocalyx, and when they're dead, they rupture and they release their DNA, and these rough cells, some of them picked up that DNA and recombined it into their genome. So now they have the ability to make a capsule, and now they are smooth strains. That's what happened. Um, so that's transformation. That's a big deal in genetic engineering. Conjugation is useful. Um, in situations, in other situations in the laboratory. Um, and it is kind of a horrible thing where a donor um, has, a, has a plasmid that gives it the ability to make um, a pillus and basically inject its DNA into the other cell. The other cell usually benefits from this. It gets a new plasmid, but still it's weird. Um, we, yeah, so what I was, what I was going to say is if we can't make bacteria competent in the laboratory, if we can't get them to take up the DNA we want them to take up, well, usually this is the backup method. Um, and this is the bacteriophage cycles. 
So we're going to look at transduction in a second, and that involves bacteria. Um, and again, um, the bacteriophage injects DNA into the bacterium. That DNA either tells the bacterium to make a bunch of phage particles, which then kill the cell, or it incorporates itself into the genome and um, every time the cell replicates, so does that bit of DNA until at some point that DNA activates basically and starts making uh, phage particles. So what, what they're showing or what, what happens here is some of these phage particles, when they are assembled for whatever reason, they don't get this DNA, they get some of this DNA. They get some of the cell's own chromosome. And so when they inject it into the next cell, they're injecting uh, bacterial DNA. Um, so that's what this says. The same thing. Um, and yeah, transduction we, we use in genetic engineering if you want to put a big piece of DNA into a cell. Because with transduction, you can get something like a piece of DNA 40,000 bases long into a cell. Um, okay, so those are the types of horizontal gene transfer. I want to give you two examples that we care about of um, horizontal gene transfer. One of them is kind of a um, notable thing that, that uh, came out when I was in graduate school, where um, a new enzyme was discovered. So people discovered this bacterial enzyme that could digest uh, porphyrin, which isn't something I had heard of, but it's a polysaccharide from red algae that is um, indigestible to most bacteria. And so these researchers found that enzyme in two different groups of bacteria. They found some in seawater. So these are bacteria that presumably would have um, found porphyrin um, in red algae in the ocean, um, but also gut bacteria from Japanese people. And these would be normal gut bacteria, not like marine saltwater bacteria, they're gut bacteria. And so where did, um, where did, what happened there? So what happened? Well, their best guess is that people would ingest some seaweed as part of their cuisine that would have on it some of the bacteria that can digest it, and horizontal gene transfer happened in their guts where some of their gut bacteria got the got this this new enzyme. And bacteria that can digest those new those polysaccharides now have a big advantage. They have a carbon and energy source that other bacteria can't use. So that's kind of um, kind of a cool story. So a little closer to home for uh, students who want to work in a clinic. Um, this is this is something that actually scares infectious disease specialists. Um, it's a long story, but I talked to one during office hours one day, and he was scared of this. Um, Basically, a patient who's very sick, who has a methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus strain, so you can't treat that strain with methicillin or other similar antibiotics, so it's hard to treat, somewhat dangerous. That person also got infected at the same time with vancomycin-resistant enterococci, um, or bacteria from the genus Enterococcus. So those are two different antibiotic resistant strains, either one of which would require containment in a, in a hospital. And it's not that unusual that a person who's unlucky in one way is unlucky in every way. Um, inside this patient, horizontal gene transfer happened and vancomycin resistance genes hopped into Staphylococcus aureus to make vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And it is resistant to vancomycin and all the things it was already resistant to. And since vancomycin is what you typically would have been treating this with, suddenly um, there's a treatment failure and they need to switch to exotic an antibiotics to, to treat this. Um, this has happened, I believe, 
Well, last time I read about it um, in 2018, it had happened, I think, nine times in the U.S. in the previous 20 years. Um, well, that brings us to the the last part of the, um, the slides. The last topic is going to be antibiotic resistance, and it's a big one, and it's important. Um, and I want you to know about it. So I'll see you with that video and that will be the last one for today.